good morning. Yeah, that's it, exactly. <laughs> you need to get beyond the, the formality of it. I just, I literally, I looked out in the room and everybody sat there. I thought this could be interesting. Um, so, uh, good morning, and I hope, hope you find the session interesting. Um, Elernity, in case you don't know, um, is a, an industry analyst organization, which I set up 18 years ago, which is kind of scary. Um, and we basically analyze um, a number of themes, particularly learning talent and actually increasingly also HR, next gen HCM type stuff within large corporate audiences. Um, so we have a corporate research network, we do a lot of corporate activity, which is when, where we first originally met Andy in one of his many uh, incarnations many, many years ago. Um, um, and as part of our kind of corporate research process, we also do a lot of independent vendor assessment, including some of the stuff we'll talk about later on, which we've just announced ready for the show this year. Um, so I'm role, my role is I'm MD, David heads our uh, research process um, and thought leadership agenda. So um, what we want to talk to you um, about today is really something which is really looking at that whole area of a discussion that's been around for some time. And I think what we want to try and do is recalibrate the way that conversation is happening, which is around, you know, what, what do we need to, to, to manage and deliver learning in the 21st century? And in particular, what implications does that have for the LMS? Um, because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hype and anti-hype around this. And in particular, this whole thing um, that was around, you know, you don't need an LMS. This is just, you know, this is part of an old school training administration type. Um, type model, it's not relevant to the, to the 21st century, um, buy our system instead, if I can put it in those terms. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we want to do based on our corporate research um, uh, insight and also frankly from looking at where, what, what is going on in the supply side is really talk about that issue in a little bit more detail and David and I are going to kind of discuss that between us a little bit and also hopefully with you guys. So be prepared to actually say something um, because we're going to ask you some questions. Um, I think the other thing that I uh, also wanted to say is um, that the, uh, for, for us, really, the key issue around it is, is not does functionality mean that we need to have a different system or whatever, but actually, what is the core role of these, these systems? How do, they, how do they really fit in terms of the corporate organizations? What's the value that they deliver? And ultimately, what's the relevance of that value in the future? And how do those things need to go forward? The key thing is for us, we have no vested interest. You know, we're not trying to sell you our, solu our solution or anybody's solution. We're also not trying to sell you our services to implement somebody else's solution either. We're not a consulting organization. We are a purely an independent analyst. So we'll start with a question. As I said, we'll get you interaction. Again. How many of you have an LMS? Who has an LMS? Please put your hand up. Okay. All right. Let's put the, how many of you don't have an LMS? Let's ask that question there. Right, so definitely minority. David, you don't count. Um, so <laughs> a few, a few organisations. So the vast majority have an LMS. Okay, how many of you, for you, is that your first and only ever LMS? Okay, how many of you are on your second LMS? Okay, third LMS. Okay, fourth LMS. We exhausted the list. <laughs> Okay. Fifth, sixth. Yeah, fifth, sixth. <laughs> I once, uh, I was saying to David when we were putting the slides together for this, I once went to a session in the States and the entry criteria to walk into the room was you had to be on at least your third LMS, okay? And the room which was this size was full, okay? And that session, that, that, that session was in 2007, so eight years ago. So the reality is, so go back to the thing is, you nearly all of you have an LMS, and for many of you, in fact, probably the majority of you, it's not your first, which probably means that whatever you had first is not, wasn't fit for purpose and you had to change it or you were forced to change it through other reasons in the organization. True? Okay. Let's start another question. Okay. How many of you are intending to uh, install or replace that LMS to do a new one within the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months? Okay, so that may be why some of you are in the session. Yeah? So again, when, when you ask that question, you will typically get maybe a minimum of 30% of the people put their hand up. That's probably typical. We did some research 
across HR community last year uh, across Europe, and typically those numbers are around 30% plus. Um, what about how many of you intending think you will change it, but not, but in slightly longer period than two years? So how many of you want to change your LMS that you have today, but haven't got a defined time scale for it? Okay, that's good. So all the people that want to change it are in the process of doing it, and they'll do that in the next two years. Okay, that's an interesting thing. David. So I think one of the interesting questions is really, what's driving you to have no LMS at all? And that is not necessarily a rhetorical question. I, I'm, that's a genuine question of why do you need an LMS? What is it giving to you? What is it driving for you in terms of your business value, the challenges that you have in your organization that say, this is a real core need for our business and our learning department. And what I'm interested in is some of you maybe can share what their drivers are. Um, Andy has the roving mic and he will get you some insights. I, I think that's actually a very interesting question because I, I, I think you'll probably get two answers, at mm -hmm. least two answers, depending on who you ask. Yep. So if you were asking the enterprise, the company, yep. they would say that they want to have an LMS so that they can see what learning is happening, who's completed what, who hasn't done what they should have done. I think from a learner's perspective, they're probably saying, why do we need an LMS, or at least a traditional type of LMS, yeah. because it's clunky, it's not user-friendly, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be doing 30-minute e-learning modules, I want things on the fly, and I'm not sure an LMS gives me that. So mm -hmm. I, I think there are, there's a, an enterprise view and yeah. a learner view. Yeah. And it, to me, it should be the learner that's driving yeah. it, not the enterprise. But I suppose there's a challenge around that. So what value is the LMS giving your L&D operation or your business? And, and I think it's interesting to say, so the functionality is one side, but what's it really doing? What's the benefit of it at a core side? And I can see some of the underlying things, but actually it's enabling individual learners, but what's the hard thing? What does it translate to? And I think that's an interesting challenge. And maybe you can share with us some of your thoughts about what your, what? what's the business need why around LMS? Why I don't LMS? need your names and why, don't, why we don't have an LMS is because we would like to use it to get people more enthusiastic because they're driven by talent and mm -hmm. it stimulates talent development and mm -hmm. that's not systematized yet. So right. That's why I'm here because I read that you have a link with talent then. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that's representative of something that we cover a little bit later. But does anybody else have another view about, so what is an LMS fundamentally doing for your business that if you took it away, you wouldn't be able to deliver? Maybe they're predictable things that you've encountered in your day-to-day -day life. I mean, you all have one, or nearly. <laughs> what's, it, what's it driving? It's probably the key Revenue. question. Compliance is the biggest one. Yeah. It's yeah. Compliance, and then that can lead to conversations. Mm -hmm. And what sort of aspects of compliance? When you say, so compliance is a nice, broad um, so just line. Compliance um, in order to make sure that they are legally compliant um, yeah. from a business sure. point of view, um, but also internally, if, if there's a salary based on what learning, what skills you have, you need yeah. to have a standardized system to do that. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very common theme around lots of the LMS deployments is this view of um, effectively licensed to operate. So can you actually do the business that you need to do with the qualifications that you have? And you see a lot of that in financial services and regulated industries. Um, and that's a, a, a big pillar, but it's not necessarily, I suppose, the big value to the organization. It's sort of driving a, a minimum tick box of, typically people have seen this content. And sometimes it's, they've seen it and they've understood it, but it doesn't necessarily give any reflection of their competence or their application in the workplace. And those are interesting challenges around, so what's driving, I suppose, to some extent the LMS? Yeah, I think, I think that prompts the question of the value to whom, yeah. yeah? Because, you know, compliance, does compliance have value to the organization? Of course it does. If you're in financial services or pharmaceuticals, I think you don't exist, yeah, unless you have that compliance. But does it deliver value from a learner's perspective, other than the fact that they're allowed to do the job they're supposed, they're trying to do? So, I mean, I think this is where it also comes down to, you know, the value to whom and, and, and how does that? So it comes back to your yeah. point. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the question is, is, are those enterprise drivers, the compliance drivers, the reporting drivers, maybe the formal link into uh, talent and gender, if you're do it, you have that already. Are those, you know, optional? Can you get rid of those? 
You know, I mean, that, that's in most organizations, we find those drivers, and we'll talk about this a bit later, yeah. are actually stronger yeah. now, not weaker. Yeah. Right? Well, so however much it might not be fit, feel it's fit for purpose from a learner's perspective and learner experience, yeah. we can't dump the fact that we still have to run on compliance reports because otherwise L&D will cease to exist and it will become a compliance function. And maybe if I can ask a slightly, slightly different question is, how many of you use your LMS to enable you to do product training? Okay. Could you do your product training without your LMS in the timescales and reach that you need to do it? Very unlikely. Do you use it for um, delivering new systems training? So if you have a new systems in the, in the organization. And these are some of the practical drivers around why we need to be able to deliver learning at scale efficiently and effectively. And usually there are two sort of underlying levers within the LMS which are driving business value, why you need them, which is actually the speed and delivery and execution of your training operation. How do you administer that people need to go through these programs in order to be compliant on that course or actually know about that product or know how to use that system? Or they've just joined the company and they don't know what to do in terms of how to get from A to B even. All these things tend to be delivered through an LMS as baseline requirements of why people introduce them. I used to work for NTL, a telecoms company. And actually, we never paid for the LMS um, just because we wanted an LMS. We paid for the LMS to deliver all of our product training. And we would not have been able to deliver 25,000 um, delegate training days in a week without having that platform. And it's that scale and reach moving the, dis the, the I suppose, the imprisonment in some ways of um, distance and time that other trans uses of the technology sometimes impose. That's not saying that you couldn't get away with using other platforms to deliver just product training, but there's a context around who the learner is, what they need to see. And I think that's an interesting sort of dynamic around the predictable drivers for training. New starters, new systems, compliance, um, typically new uh, product, and sometimes then you're looking about, so what are the performance gaps or the performance opportunities of people having some broader view, maybe linked more to capability. So, um, so, so given the fact that probably the underlying premise is that the drivers around this haven't gone away, in fact, they're probably stronger, why do we keep having to change it? Why, what's wrong with the LMSs that we keep having to have, you know, second, third generation, fourth generation things? What, what, what was wrong with them? Different needs. When I look at LMSs in general, you see two Sorry, flavors. Can you use oh. the mic so the, the others yeah, can? Uh, two flavors. One very much focused on only delivering, let's say, e-learning. Yep. Yes. And then one which is which has a very, very strong, um, let's say, live training registration yep. back end on it, which doesn't deliver the other end. So I, I think depending on what your needs are in, in your business at that moment, yeah. that's the choice. And then we, we recently switched just because we had one company and the customer service was just rubbish. Yeah. So purely from that standpoint, yeah. um, we weren't getting what we needed. So we. So you've got, you've got issues around the chaining, na change of nature of, no, of learning and wanting to diversify that. You've got issues around um, the service you're getting and is it any good? Um, the, other, the other really common requirement you see is our HR system is called this and our vendor is called that, and now in future our, H our, our learning vendor is gonna to have to be compatible with that HR system. How many of you have got that kind of driver going on? I mean, there's, there's many reasons why people have changed their system, partly because often the first time that they bought it, maybe they were a bit naive about what they thought they needed as well. So there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of drivers. The key thing to understand though, is in a typical audience set like this or across the whole of the conference group, probably 30% or so of that audience is looking to change what they have, which is pretty high. Um, probably the majority of organizations are not on their first, which means that they got it wrong the first time at least. And in many cases, you'll find a fairly reasonable percentage are on second or third generation. Now, if that was over 20 years, Maybe that's okay, but often it's not over 20 years, it's over five years. You know, if you're on the third one after five years, then probably there's something that, that, you know, that is wrong with what you're doing. Or you're not in control of the broader politics, IT landscape mm -hmm. that's dictating some of those choices. Mm -hmm. I would also say I think it's a lack of the, the industry keeping up. Yep. Yep. The lack of the industry keeping up in the yes. sense that you, you have some big players in the market right now who have gone very fat and, ha and happy with all their big enterprise clients who haven't been changing with the times. Right. Yeah. You know, why doesn't an LMS out of the box look like Netflix? Because all yeah. our learners know how to use Netflix. Yeah. Right. It's really no-brainer stuff yes. like that. Okay. 
They obviously don't live in the Cotswolds then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think ultimately this all comes together really with a set, you know, alter, with, for us, we, we want to talk about, you know, what really makes it fit for purpose to support 21st century learning. And I think all of the themes that we're talking about really are part of that agenda. And ultimately that's, I think, you know, that's, that's what we want to try and address in this session. And then we'll talk a bit at the end around market and what does this mean for supply side and vendors. David? I think this was yours, I think. That's fine. Oh, let's do that. Okay. So let, I'm doing, okay, uh, let's, let's think about then, what we want to do is really talk about, I guess, four main themes. Right? And simplistically, you can, uh, you can break that down to how and why, what and when, where and who, and so what. So what's the point? What's the value? What's the benefit? Okay? Um, and ultimately within this, and I think you talked about changing you know, changing nature of learning, changing nature of the way that the learners want to engage with learning. We also, there's also drivers around the changing learning function. There's drivers around the changing IT landscape. Ultimately, it's around how do these things support innovation, if you like, over time that's happening around this. And I think the point that was made is a lot of these systems, particularly if they're IT dictated, are, have a glacial pace of in innovation, yeah? It's, it's way behind where the learning function is trying to be, and it's even further behind where the business wants to be. So what we want to do is really talk about those four themes as, if you like, core, core themes, and then talk a bit about the implications for supply side. Does that make sense? So this is me. <laughs> so we're trying to work out. We're trying to work out who's going to do what. So I just keep on saying it's David. Yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> just point across. So ultimately, one of the things that um, one of the key words that we hear L and D as a function talking about or having imposed on it is effectively what is the agility of the L and D function? How can it transform itself to be more relevant, more focused, and, and so on, around what it is. The underlying operating model in many organizations, so we mainly analyze large, complex companies. Shell, Vodafone, BP, RBS, Lloyds, Novartis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So big global multinationals. Do they have a singular learning function? Do they have one business? Do they have one geography? The answer to all those questions is typically no, and no in, in, to a factor of maybe 100. You know, so in those environments, how they manage structure learning is, is, a, is an ongoing changing process. There's probably a, I, I don't like to talk about the seven year itch cycle that goes on around the way that they centralize and decentralize the learning function. Yeah, so you, we'll create a corporate university, we'll pull it all together, we'll have a shared service function. How many of you have got, going to go through this journey or have been through this journey? We'll have a shared service function that will manage all the learning. They'll do that for three to five years and then they'll realize that the business has invented a whole bunch of people who are trainers who aren't called trainers. That nobody wants to place the cent pay the central headcount structure. So at some point they'll then decentralize it, they'll keep some things very stealthy, you know, uh, leadership and um, maybe all, uh, some, some, some sort of global competency stuff, diversity training, the rest gets pushed back out into the business and vice versa. And the seven years later, we'll go through the same cycle. So there's something which is around an underlying structural issue around the way that the, 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 the learning is set up, the processes it has, the degree of harmonization. And typically in most large organizations, one size doesn't fit all, right? One size fits nobody. Okay, other than maybe one very narrow context. And one of the reasons that we have problems, and one of the reasons big companies have many LMSs, is because of exactly that. You know, they've got different divisions and different business units that have bought different things, and they're constantly trying to migrate that. How many of you are thinking about going from multiple LMSs to a one LMS globally? Okay, that's a very common sub-theme that we're finding organizations doing. So there's something which is around the learning operating model, the degree of autonomy that that has at a local and regional level. There's things around the way in which those processes, structures, how they serve different parts of the learning curriculum, if you like. What, what works really well for, um, so I'll give you an example, approvals on courses mm -hmm. as a process, you can sit there and say, well, actually, for these compliant courses, and there's no approval for you to book on it. You've just got to do it. It's mandatory. Others courses you have to approve. If you want to book on the CBA leadership program that costs me 20 grand a head in INSEAD, probably I have to go through a few levels of approval before I can do that. So there are these things. These are never even standardized, even when they're standardized. And one of the challenges with shared services is their inability to actually deliver that. And maybe just to add to that is these aren't static states. People start off with a federated organization and then somebody says, well, you need to be all centralized. 
and that upsets your processes and the system's ability to flex to that change varies from platform to platform. Or you might be a centralized organization, actually the pressure is to be more federated, actually provide more ownership in departments and business divisions. And that's really interesting because the people who've deployed quite often the strongly centralized platforms don't have the flex to be able to do the devolved configuration that makes them successful in a federated environment. So all these states are actually also moving and quite Quite often, the tension of do I love or hate my LMS isn't just about the LMS, it's about the state that you're in as an organization in terms of your strategy, your scope, your approach, and the ability of the system to flex to that. Because sometimes it's trying to support things that you've moved to rather than where you were. And that not all systems are equal in their ability to sort effect effectively flex between the different models and different states. And it creates a lot of overhead and a lot of management change. So, so I think the key thing with one of this is come back to the point that was made earlier. This is a, these are enterprise drivers, right? This is around the structure of the learning function. This is not about is the learning what what's the learning like for the user experience and, and what is the, the, the user experience for the LMS like. This is about how is learning structured, managed, and reported across the organization and how it fits into things. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Oh, OK. Um, so basically, this, this is just trying to sort of give another view, and we've lost some of the fonts, which I apologise for. I did give them two, but I did obviously missed one, so apologies for that. But basically, we, I think the other, one of the other sort of tensions around L and D is actually its um, psychology or its uh, psyche about. So how does it perform? And what I've tried to, in, 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 I suppose, illustrate here are two big wheels. One well, actually, one's a smaller wheel. One's the faster wheel of operational performance, and those are sort of, I suppose, a, an identity for learning where you're supporting your business business in rolling out a new product, and you've got to deliver that in three months. You've got a new system that's going to come in in six to 12 months. That's got to be ready and live in the, in the organization. You have new regulations that you need to make um, visible and be compliant around. Actually, these are fast cycle things that it's about business survival today. And wherever you probably are more reactive to those business demands, because you're heavily aligned to your um, business leaders, actually, you're probably in this operational performance. And the drivers around that are much more about learning. It's about instructor-led training. It's about social performance management. It's things like license to operate, bite-sized learning, performance support. Now, some of these things aren't necessarily compatible or in the same mindset at all of some of the bigger, wider business sort of capability. It's about, so what about future survival? And that's really about that future readiness, which is, I suppose, uh, the lens of talent management, which is not about how we're going to survive today, but what capabilities do we need to have in three years' time to take advantage of that new opportunity in the marketplace or to deliver that new product that we don't even know what it's called yet. And all the skills that we need in our organization to maybe move into a new marketplace. Maybe you want to move into Germany, or you want to move in the UK, or moving to, to Brazil. What are the competencies and mindset that you move to move from a startup into a more mature organization? These are some of the longer term future readiness things, which cover things like job families and job roles and reward and recruitment, this whole sort of big uh, talent cycle, which actually have a different mentality. They're not fast and responsive, they're about making strategic plans. And the ability of systems to work in both of those areas, 10 times quite frequently differs quite in the extreme. But it gives you a sense of identity. And that's what we suppose mean by scope and sophistication of your learning operation and its focus. This drives some of the dynamic around whether your LMS is fit for purpose or not, and whether it has longevity. So, so, yeah. so. I was wondering, are you saying now that up until now, most of the LMSs just work on the so I think well, that, probably, I think the reality is that when you look at that now, one, most of the LMSs don't work on either of the circles. Ah. Yeah, I right? know that's the point I was kind of going to make actually is that actually when you look at it, it kind of is in the boundary between the two, managing formal training. Yeah, whether that's compliance, whether it's e-learning, I don't really care whether it's e-learning or classroom training or whatever. Well, I do a bit, but in reality, it's still that formal learning agenda is still kind of licked in sort of the boundaries, of it, and it was kind of optimised for an admin capability in the middle of that. But actually, when you look at what David's talked about in terms of that operational performance, most of your LMSs they don't deliver that very well, yeah. or in in a way that is actually very useful. Um, but they also don't do the top piece very well either, right? So it's a bit of a condemnation in some ways and, and, and a struggle around how to do it. And I think if you looked at current LMSs, most of them will do some of the effectively things that were old school to some extent in terms of learning, like delivering instructor-led training, delivering e-learning, um, delivering the on-the-job training potentially, if, if you're lucky. They do very little else sometimes. And this is a change in some focus and practice and L&D strategy around how we're expecting learning to be operating in our businesses 
businesses, and they're not necessarily designed to work in that way. So, so um, overall, this is all about then the innovation in the, what your strategy is, but also then how you structure that, the operating model that you have, both in terms of organizationally, but then also in terms of the learning components and how they fit into the broader landscape. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That kind of segues us probably yeah, sure. quite nicely. David, this. So it's not working and existing that way? Or it's not being used that way? It, it, well, it, it, both, it, and in fact, both. It's not being both. used to manage those things today. And actually, when you look at it, probably it will struggle to manage many of those things today. Although, actually, of course, a lot of the, the products and solutions have evolved to be able to do more of that. The reality is the implementations that you have inside your organization, that's out of scope. That what? stuff is often turned off. Yeah. And what's our system? that are moving in that direction because it's so, very Okay, so let's come back and talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about that. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. take that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> no, we no. we don't have any of the solutions. <laughs> but I think what's interesting is we're seeing this sort of shift. And, and traditionally, people used to deliver their formal learning. That was the remit of a learning and development department. And, um, and maybe if we could do a show of hands for those people who, who have to deliver formal training as part of their role within their organization. It'd be just useful to see a sh show of hands. And you um, deliver formal training. Formal training. Part of your, in your organization. So what are the rest of you doing here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. OK. But that has been the bedrock. And I think the innovation probably over the last 10, 15 years is actually expansion around e-learning. We've gone from deliver it face to face to thinking about how can we do that more virtually? Because that gives us scale, speed, agility, um, reach, and gives us cost efficiencies. So that's what been one of the drivers. So we've got things down here about sort of uh, generic e-learning, instructor-led training, live virtual classrooms. Those are typically the things that people start to put in. And they will make them launch out of the learning management system. And maybe they might have embedded that in a learning portal in some form. And that's probably where most people have come from. But probably over the last um, five, six years, maybe a bit longer, there's been this push more to collaboration and sharing as being an agenda in its own right. Because actually, there's organizational learning, social learning that happens in the organization through communities of practice, communities of excellence. Um, it's where you get the experts together, and they build new knowledge that never existed before. And that is actually a, a really important part of the L&D mix. How L&D actually get their hands around that and what their role is in that is a real struggle. Because do they, are they supposed to be the input? Are they the facilitator? Should the business be doing itself? Um, should, the only it tracked, should it be tracked anyway? Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. Can you track it anyway? Yeah, yeah. And, and what is the L&D's role in supporting social learning in that sense? And, it's, so, and there may be a role, but it's an interesting point of debate about so what really is the, the, the importance and, I suppose, the impact that they can have. But that's been a whole big shift in what some of the expectations around these systems. In the past, it was just deliver me my formal training that's ram it down people's throats. They've got to go through my face-to-face -face training, or they must do my compliance training, and I've got to hunt down the people who haven't done it. Um, but there's been this shift, this sort of migration to more collaboration. But the other thing that David, we've always done. You are allowed to pause for breath occasionally. I know, but I got excited. <laughs> You're getting faster and faster. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, he's got, we've got a lot to say, though, but I'm just saying. I was getting, sorry, I was getting <laughs> overly excited, and I'll take another big breath now. Okay. But I think one of the really interesting things is what has always happened in organizations is workplace learning. And to some extent, it's been devalued as being called sitting with Nelly. Um, Coaching is, is fundamental to how our organizations perform, but it's sometimes been devalued by the technology. But all these things around workplace learning, and we've got so action learning sets, probably the most important thing that you can do when you're learning something and want to transfer, for, translate it into the workplace is actually be given a project and be supported through that project through some mentoring. How much real is that in terms of driving proficiency? It's a tr transformationally very different place, but the learning platforms in the past have been placed in this learning, formal learning zone. So they're trying to adopt some of these things. So you'll start to see features of merging probably over the last um, five years around on-the-job training. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> but this shift to workplace learning has is, 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 is been there and it's been ignored. And what's happening around the platforms is they're trying to take that more seriously, but it's not where they're at now. So, so and there's that's another, a tension, sorry, David. And there's, and there's a really important manifestation of this. How many of your organizations are talking about 70, 20, 10 as a kind of strategy and so on? OK, and I, th I think what we're seeing is obviously that terminology, if you like, and that kind of reference model has become 
quite uh, established in terms of thinking within L&D about where it, it needs to go. But actually, most organizations that we work with have no clue mm -hmm. what, how they really deliver that. Yeah. And I think a lot of the 70%, you know, a lot of the issue is around that 70. And just because L&D doesn't have its arms around it doesn't mean it doesn't happen or it's not a value. Mm. Yeah. So I think one of the things, and you know, again, this is an offline conversation rather than a conversation now, is, is trying to think around how you build strategies, or some people will talk about learning architectures or whatever it is, that really enable you to address that model in an executable way. 70, 20, 10 is a, is a nice fire sound bite, but not necessarily a deliverable reality in many organizations. So if you really believe in the 70, 20, 10 or, or more beyond that, What's your experience? Who in the companies engage it more and are more into it already organizing it? So, so first of all, 702010 is a concept that only L&D has, mm. right? The business doesn't get this at all, right? So, and, and, and actually, L&D talking about it in those terms is at risk of alienating and disconnecting with the business even more than it possibly is at the moment. So there is a risk around the way that, that are looking at it from that perspective. But I think, I think the key thing is around what we're seeing, the, the biggest challenge for organizations, they get the 10, they maybe do it well, they maybe don't do it well, but they get the 10. The 20, they've got ideas around, okay? And, and they're, they're thinking about how they do that. The 70 is where they really have no clue. And there's a big disconnect. And again, one of the challenges is around the LMS is that generally now organizations that are coming in and looking at these platforms are really interested in the, the 20 and the 70. And, they, and, and it's just out of scope. You know? When all you do is IoT, you know, e-learning tracking and IoT um, uh, administration, you know, that doesn't really solve any problems. So. And who are your most value uh, conversation partners and its sparing partners? Who are, who's involved in that conversation? Who's most valuable, valuable. in it? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question, actually. And I think, um, I think it exists probably in the boundary between, um, I, between some people within the L you know, with, on the L&D side absolutely get that and are very focused on it. I think sometimes they are artificially dismissive of the 10. Hmm. Right? You shouldn't forget about the fact that a lot of people that are advocating that 70 and thing have got an invested interest because they're trying to sell you stuff to support 70, not the 10, mm -hmm. right? So there's vested interest allotted across all of this. Um, I think the other thing is, how do you get the business engaged in that conversation? We'll come back to that a little bit later, I think, if we can. Um, so again, I'm conscious of time. We will absolutely run out, as always is the, the case. The other areas of innovation, which is happening in many of these in, in all organizations, really, and on the supply side as well here is the, the innovation of that learning within the overall talent landscape and life cycle. The, I'm not going to talk through the diagram, but that's our, our talent life cycle that we use as part of our um, uh, strategy and vendor assessment. And it goes all the way from design, acquire, uh, acquire perform, develop, optimize, retain. And when you look at that, actually, from a solutions point of view at the moment, even when I look at the big bloated, I think was the expression, uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, talent suites and HR suites, actually, they only do still part of that story. There's big gaps still in it, and they don't necessarily fit together. But how many of your organizations are looking at how you join learning up with talent? OK, so anybody who didn't put their hand up, that's a problem. Okay, mm -hmm. um, because what it means is that the people that are in talent are looking up how they're joining learning and you're not part of that conversation. Yes. Okay, so there is a really important point. I mean, when you look at talent management as an issue, so first of all, I, I kind of put a caveat. In Europe, our research says when you talk about talent management, that tends to mean something slightly different than when you talk about it in the States. Yeah. Okay, for most organizations here, talent is a, an elite few still. It's you know, senior leadership, future leader pipeline, maybe some critical roles, maybe graduate intake, hypo type stuff. How many of you does talent mean everybody in your company? Yeah, so again, that's a fairly normal picture. So still here, the majority view is that around talent, and if there's a head of talent management, their primary focus is on a subset of the audience, but we're shifting there, okay? Now, the head of the center of that talent management debate on those was around Performance management, maybe some very high-level developmental programs, maybe maybe um, and maybe there's some acquisition stuff. Okay, 
what we're seeing as, as organizations become more focused on the broader audience, actually the shift of what the center of talent management changed away from succession and performance, maybe down towards development, learning, maybe even with, with some stuff linking through to rewards. So there's a change in axis underneath it. But this is something that, again, is a really, is an important part. You know, one of the things we talk around is learning as the engine room of talent management. It's one of the few actors you have, yeah? When you, re when you recruit people into a company, you know, one of the reasons they come is because, you know, top, one of the top three reasons is because of the, what it's gonna do for them in terms of their career and things, the development experience that you can bring. One of the top three reasons people leave is because they didn't get that development and experience, okay? And one of the few things that you can do in the middle other than pay them more that actually really changes what they do is actually develop them so that based on background performance and also future readiness and capability. So development and learning is central to the whole value proposition, the employee value proposition. But actually in many organizations, it's not part of that strategic talent conversation. And that is a, is a big issue, I think. Um, the other thing is that from a system side here is that you know, the, you have answers to some of those things. It lives in your HR suite, or you're using, you know, a product to do performance management. It's a mess, right? And it was made even more of a mess when Oracle and SAP and things went out and bought other companies. So sometimes it's quite a common scenario to find companies that are using perform, you know, success factors for performance management. They were using um, uh, Taleo for recruiting. And then they're running, you know, uh, whether it's SAP or whatever it is. For and you know, these are now on different fiefdoms. They don't, they're incompatible strategically. Learning tended to be best of breed. Or if you were unfortunate enough to get imposed on the HR LMS solution, you're just damaged, really. You're disabled <laughs> to doing anything else going forward. So, so frank, frankly, it's either, you know, which is why typically that was a best of breed solution. Now, of course, all those things have all the suites and all the answers and you have no control almost yeah. about the discussion about where it goes. I mean, in some ways this is reflected through, this, is a, this diagram is an integration diagram between an LMS and related systems. This is actually a real customer scenario. This is actually from a, a specific customer and it's simplified, <laughs> right? So we have, for example, two HR systems, whereas in reality they had 16, okay? We have, uh, multiple talent applications, multiple learning applications. Actually, the biggest point of failure, um, often with, with LMS is people get very obsessed about does it integrate with our HR system? Actually, that's not that difficult to do. The only issue is how good is the data that's in the HR system, mm -hmm. right? The biggest point of failure typically around LMSs is, is, is in the learning applications. Yeah. You know, does it, can you hook to your virtual classrooms, your external content companies? When you launch the content, it doesn't track properly. You know, so therefore your compliance reports are up the spout. There's lots of issues around the way it works. But ultimately what you can do is really view that, go back to my previous, as three kind of main driving areas. We want to, the LMS needs to be integrated with learning and that learning that we want to integrate with as per David's thing before is not e-learning and classroom training. It's much more diverse now. We also want to be able to integrate with talent and in multiple parts. And in reality, we really almost want to reseat this so that the LMS becomes a very core component. If it's really the engine room of talent management, how do I fit it in that central position? How do I make it really deliver value and underpin the rest? Because it's the bit most of your learners go to. A real customer scenario. Um, uh, new career building site put in by the head of talent management in a, a large insurance company, okay? Um, they went to the Learning Academy, which has been, was very well established, and asked them to recalibrate all their competency frameworks to be consistent with the career building website. Okay? That's not an uncommon type conversation because the talent agenda and therefore and the competency was being driven by that uh, talent, the head of talent who was not, wasn't focused on learning at all. Okay? So they were in this debate. They had... 10,000 people a month going through their learning academy and 80 going through the career building site, right? But who do you think was the most senior in terms of that conversation about what was happening? So there's some real issues there. Yeah. The final bit, which we do, I, I want to emphasize, because then when we come back to the last point is, is around that work drivers. Mm. Actually, the biggest challenge for all of us is not how we connect learning with other learning or learning with talent, it's how we connect it with work, yeah? And that is the fundamental shift that we really need to make. And actually, the biggest challenge for LMSs is, is not can they manage new types of learning or can they manage new types of operating model for learning, the learning function. It's actually, 
Are they work systems or not? And I think if, if I was to do this diagram again, what I'd do is I wouldn't do it through the L&D's view, which puts the LMS at the center of the universe. I'd put it from the employee's point of view. Yeah, and at the point you do that, suddenly this has a completely different center, has a different sense of um, priority, and that does a fundamental shift around, so what is the priority importance of all these integrations and where the LMS should be appearing? <coughs> and that's one of the interesting things just around this diagram. So, sorry, can we, uh, yeah. I'm just kind of conscious sorry. of time. Yeah. How are we going for that? No, sorry. 20 minutes left. <laughs> right. We can talk afterwards, so we'll be around. So. And, and I think just the other thing that we see around innovation is actually innovation around impact. And we've put this up just not because it's maybe talking about innovation around impact, but because it's illustrative of your progress to actually talking about the impact you're having in the business. This is our maturity model around um, analytics. And what's interesting from our experience of talking to large corporates is their ability to articulate their efficiency and effectiveness within their organization through their metrics and their KPIs um, is a really good signal around how they are mature and effective as their organization. So it's almost sort of self-fulfilling in its own right. So for those people who only do passive reporting, canned reports, um, which don't necessarily link to KPIs, they are a level of maturity, not just in terms of their reporting, but their organization is an function. And when we're talking about impact, the thing that you're interested in is what value are you really driving in terms of return investment from your training? And as you start to move up the maturity model, you're starting to get a stronger view of that. But there's a real, I suppose, a synergy between how much do we ask for um, and direct our activities around real tangible business impact, the numbers of KPIs of our business, and what do we talk to our stakeholders about? Do we talk to our business stakeholders in terms of number of training days, or do we talk to them in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of delivering a product launch and the upsell that's happening as a result of the training that you've done? These are some of the fundamental um, lenses that we use in terms of understanding impact. And I think it's really important to get a view and get a sense of where you are on that line, and not about what analytics you need to do, but what answers should you be giving and providing your business to drive what you should be talking it's about. It's almost where you place. are on the bottom line, in fact. You know, how operational are you? Are you just reporting activity measures, which is where many organizations still are? You know, or actually, are you really talking about something, you know, talking about some strategic measures that really the board will relate, relate to, rather than how many training days you did and what the happy sheets were? Sure. Um, and uh, I mean, and that's the key thing. I think the other thing is your HR colleagues are sitting there talking a lot at conferences like this about big data. Yeah, does that come across? Mm -hmm. You know, I actually think that you know, okay, so big data is also you know, it's clearly part of that agenda. But what about little data? Yeah, what about the operate? You know, the ability to meaningfully talk about the, how efficient your processes are, what you're doing. You know, there are a lot of basic things that are missing in terms of the learning operation. Again, these are pushing. Reporting is a common point of pain. When you look mm. at why people changing LMSs, the yeah. fact that their reporting is rubbish is typically part of it. You know? And it's both in terms of the reports they get, the data they get, but actually their ability to, to do that, to, to do that flexibly, to create bespoke reports for the business and so on. So it's a common point of pain. And the other side, of course, is actually around the user experience and the innovation in that. So I think, again, within the comments earlier that when we were talking about one of the sub -th clear sub-things there is, and it comes back to this user-centered design type view, is do we want things that look like SAP? You know, the only thing now is it's not on a green screen. Okay? So I apologize to anybody who's using SAP or mm -hmm. is from SAP, maybe even more. Um, yeah, but how do we create really design experiences and user experiences that are much more uh, you know, high impact, engaging, and so on. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of those isn't an LMS. I'm not sure if you can spot the one. Yeah? And I put the BBC website up there because they fundamentally changed the way that their system works. What they've started to do is design for tablet first. So we are seeing an evolution in user experience. But again, this is through the lens of the L&D LMS rather than the workplace. And I think that's a really big challenge about how we integrate the experience, not just through the LMS and making some of the process a bit slicker and making the look and feel look nicer. How does it fundamentally support and embed in your business process is probably a bigger question. It's the middle one of LMS. Yes. No, this, this one here is not an LMS. It's not an LMS. <laughs> and the thing is, that's the problem. We have this sort of user experience which is driven by a whole consumer world where people are presenting us with data all the time. And it does not necessarily match 
what we want to present sometimes is L&D. Why are you, are you showing us this? I don't, I don't get it. Okay, so basically there's some big shifts that are happening and they are led outside of the LMS arena, which effectively illustrates some of the big pressures and expression of what those systems are doing. Yes, being customer centered. It's, it's about business. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, what the theme of this, this, this mm -hmm. part of it, and we'll, you know, we'll put that four layer diagram up, is, is about innovation, innovation and the impact that you are making in the business. And I think that can be felt in, in two main ways. One is around the engagement you have with your people in the business, whether they're internal learners or whether they're external learners or whoever they are, a lot of which is driven around the user experience and their level of engagement with it and, and their ease of accessing things. The other one is around the innovation in terms of the impact you make in the business, your ability to articulate mm -hmm. impact, the ability to report, the ability to engage in that analytics conversation. So for us, those there are, you know, we keep focusing on user experience as kind mm -hmm. of something separate, but actually it's really around, you know, it ultimately it's down is, is how, in, how, how Act, you know, how important is this in the business? And fixing this is really a part of making it more important to this, answering some of that so what question, as well as being able to say, and this is what it's delivering for us. So let me just, I just want to kind of, and again, I'm conscious of time. Um, so we won't have any time probably for Q&A in terms of the um, end of the session, unfortunately, but we'll, we can do it after if, if anybody's interested. But I mean, just in terms of things, we've got, we just want to talk about what does this mean on the supply side? Because if that's the, the reality of what's happening in terms of corporate need and in terms of the demand, so when we look at you know, pretty much every RFP that comes out now, user experience is the top line. Okay? Um, when you ask them what they want by that, they normally start talking about things Amazon. like Netflix and Amazon and mm -hmm. some of these kinds of sites, even though actually some of those are really, really complicated. I don't know if you noticed, but Amazon is a hugely complicated interface with lots of built-in intelligence and stuff. It's also not the same for you as it is for me. You see different stuff than I do, right? Uh, so it's actually, it, it's kind of personalized, it's intelligent in terms of what it's trying to do. So if that's the landscape, what are the vendors doing about it? Um, so ultimately, and, and the, can you give me the LMS report? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the things um, this is, is, is a subset of, and I'll talk about this in a second, is the, um, we we constantly analysing this, and one of the things are you, there's a few of these at the front if you want to pick them up. But but basically, we announced yesterday our 2015 nine grid, which is our market assessment tool in the LMS market, alongside uh, a couple of others, authoring tools, bespoke e-learning, and so on. Um, we also, and the you know, one of the things we do in those is we talk about which trends are we looking at in terms of the the, ven the ability of the vendors to meet those and how is that impacting their performance and potential and so on and i'm going to put the the diagram up in a second and we can talk about that in terms of vendor impact some of the trends that we're we're, we're kind of looking for you know is so this thing around um you know, compliance doesn't mean attendance. Now it starts to mean competence. There's a shift in what we mean by those things. Um, academies are coming back on. I talked. I did a presentation a couple of years ago about the sort of renaissance, the the, the fall and rise of, of of academies, and in particular, um, and again, something David can talk a lot around is this kind of high impact portal experience that people want around an academy. They don't want it to look like an LMS environment, a training list of training courses. They want it to be very focused on the audience. They want to be very focused on that content that, that's relevant to that audience and so on. And they want it to be much more engaging. Um, software as a service, um, maybe extra enterprise views in terms of business to business training. So it's not just about your internal staff, it's about the external audiences. Um, the HCM piece, you know, I talked about the SAP Oracle acquisitions. That's polarizing the way that big corporates look at their choices, vendor choices. Um, so there's a bunch of changes on the market trends. And then on the solution trends, we're now talking about a lot of things that, 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 that we touched on. So the, the user, you know, consumerization of the user experience, um, mobile first. So pretty much every vendor, or, or, or certainly in the major thing, is almost designing now for mobile first, for a tablet primarily, not a smartphone, as the primary vehicle. And you're seeing quite significant changes in the user experience around that. Whether they're yet, there yet is a debate, mm -hmm. but that's what's going on. So you can't go to a vendor and say, have you got a mobile thing? Because they've all got one. The question is, where are they in that shift and, and, and what is it? And how is, if they are a cross-talent HR vendor, how much has that user experience moved across all parts of the suite, or is it been done on a siloed basis within it? Big data we touched on. 
Uh, gamification, again, you go downstairs, you'll hear a lot of people talking about gamification. But that whole diversification in the learning ecosystem, that big wheel David put up, talking about that. Um, <coughs> Uh, things like Tin Can, um, uh, Experience API, potentially. Again, some of that it may be more on the exists more on the paper to tick than it does in terms of practical project reality for many organisations. But these things are the, are the directions we're going. So there's a whole bunch of these trends which, which you take away from what we've just talked about, plus general shifts in the marketplace that are really impacting the vendors. David, anything to add to that? No. <laughs> so. This is the 2015 nine grid. Um, so our nine, the nine grid model, just to explain, is it's, first of all, this is designed mainly for what a functional audience, so HR, talent learning, not for IT. Um, it's strangely enough uses nine boxes, a lot of the, um, and, and we thought that was a metaphor that talent and, and HR understood, yeah? Around performance and people and, and, and nine box assessment, potential versus performance. What, this, what we do when we look at it though, this is built largely from the insights we get from our corporate research network and experience, plus also the independent briefing activity and what we see in the marketplace. Because we provide quite a lot of independent advisory input into corporate uh, decisions and into procurement processes, we often then see visibility of that through things like RFP processes and so on as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of factors that go in. The other thing that this is, in the case of the LMS one, this one is weighted towards an EMEA, weight, it's what we call a EMEA weighted global. So because we're largely focused on large enterprise, we tend to filter ones that are relevant, solutions that are relevant to those enterprise organizations, but we want to weight it towards the EMEA market, okay? Because most of the, and, and the reason for that is most of the um, market analysis, the, the, uh, the, you know, the mainstream IT analysis here is very US centric. In fact, nobody really now, has LMS-specific stuff. It's all part of an integrated talent view anyway. But even if it was, it's still largely US-centric in terms of the view. Fun and, and funnily enough, European companies have different needs. Not least, they have to have more than one language. Yeah? They maybe have different legal frameworks. They've got different reporting requirements, different regulatory frameworks that they're working with. And they're probably more complicated. They don't function as a one-size-fits-all business. So one of the things we're doing is looking at weight it, we're weighting it based on the ability to serve those needs and the ability to, um, uh, the, the, the uh, suitability of the solution and also of the organization. You know, do they have experience in working with the mayor organizations? Um, some changes this year, I'll just kind of put it at that and then I'm, we're happy to talk about this offline or come downstairs to the analyst lounge that we've got. Um, we've moved, you know, there are some, some, some significant changes. We've got a new, couple of new entrants. We took a couple out because we didn't have enough corporate reference experience for it. Um, We've got uh, some organizations increasing in size. So for example, Cal both Calidus and Totar in the middle have moved into our mid-banding. Mm -hmm. um, the position in individual nine box is not relative to the other players. It's our view of their trajectory. Yeah, yeah? their trajectory. So where, where are they trending to possibly for next time? Mm -hmm. So if somebody like Cornerstone we've put above Saba, doesn't mean we think Cornerstone's potential is bigger. We just think, we've said that the material, from our point of view, they're materially the same. Yeah, yeah. It's because it's not relative, but it's so in the uh, talent, there's a talent nine grid over there. We've got separate mm -hmm. assessments from an integrated talent point of view. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's clearly within this is you know, is also around what are the trends in terms of customer experience. So, for example, the other one, the big other big change is Saba, which is obviously one of the big market players. We've recalibrated their solution based on Saba Cloud, then their new SaaS environment rather than the Saba Enterprise platform, which has done two things. It's it's lost some of the negative customer experience because obviously it's very new. But also it's done, it's recalibrated the price point because as a SaaS solution with a more aggressive price position, the cost of ownership figures are, are lower, both in terms of acquisition, implementation, but also in terms of ongoing operating cost. Um, any, anybody got specific questions around anybody on that list? I know that's a dangerous thing to ask when you've got 10 minutes left. David, maybe it's just worth, while, while people are forming a question in their mind, maybe it's also just worth talking a little bit about um, the relative positioning overall um, and the relevance of... Go on. If you, I don't know, does anybody look at Gartner Magic Quadrant sort of models, okay? Um, is the temptation always to look at the top right and think they're the best, yeah? 
in our model, we try and make, assume that actually every box has value because not all organizations need the most functional, most innovative platform. And actually, it's about trying to calibrate some of the expectation about what you require from the platform and your ability to manage the platform and the vendor, which are also important, and how they perform space with clients as well. And that's what we tried to sort of represent in terms of this potential layers. And they're just sort of overall bandings from our perspective about, OK, so how can they cope with sophistication and complexity and enable you to extract value? And every box has uh, value. David, maybe you could... Some of them more than others, maybe. Or, yeah, you know, but exactly. I think I think the other side of it as well is that this is... So if you think about the way you would use a nine, nine box talent grid inside an organization, yeah, what you're assessing, the people you have, you stick them in there, you know, so top left is always, you know, called rough diamonds, you know, people great potential, but they're not really delivering and performing in the organization, but they have great potential. The whole point about those is not just to pick, okay, we just pick the people in the top right and everybody else we get rid of. It's what do you do with those people to increase their value to the organization, yeah? So it's actually about how you drive value from them. So there's, there is, as David said, value in all of the things, but what you do to maximize that value is different depending on where they are. OK, so there, you know, you, some of you will be looking at this thinking, I want to, I'm going to go out and buy a, a new solution. Which vendors should I consider? Which are the comparative ones? And so on, things like that. So that's one lens. The other lens is you might be looking at that going, oh my god, my, my one's in the bot, you know, left-hand side. You know, what? But actually, that, that within, within an individual, individual box, there are a set of actions that can go along with that, which says, OK, what do we do with that? You know, if we've got something that is medium potential, but actually is low, lower performing at the moment, why is that the case? What do we do about that to increase the, the value out of what we have? And I think one of the challenges, and the LMS market mm. is kind of rife with it, is, is the sense of we get, some, get something, we get a bad experience around it, and then we don't do anything about it. We just kind of whinge about it, and then at some point we try and throw it away. And, and those, these systems are big systems. They're hard, hard to work. So it's, you should think about the, your strategy for driving value, driving yourself mm. right into the higher performance areas, even if you're stuck with solutions that are on the left-hand side. So you, should, you can view this as a comparative from a selection point of view. You can view it as an action tool if, you're, if you've got those. The other thing we can do, which we, we've, we've done, is weighted it to specific organizational requirements. So if you've got an organization that has to have, for example, pharmaceuticals, they have to have validated systems. Okay, immediately that would take a whole bunch of those options off the table. It would change the relative positioning. So the other key thing is, so the, the point around this is you work out where you want to be in this, but also work out how, those, how your weightings can be, can be skewed around it. So it's a, it's a much more kind of a complex tool, potentially, in terms of the way that you can use it. The color, in case you didn't, can't see it, is cost of ownership. Right? So the other thing that we deliberately want to create a conversation around is effectively, in some ways, complexity or sophistication versus cost of ownership. Yeah? So clearly, actually, for a lot of organizations, being down in the bottom right-hand side, which is very high-performing and cheap, might be a really good place to be. Retailers, good example mm. of that. Yeah? Do they really want the complexity of being right in the high potential if they could have something that was much more high performing and very fit for purpose. So that's the kind of conversation that you potentially want to, to create. And there are multiple ones of these. If you come down onto the stand downstairs, onto the, into our analyst lounge, um, you can see these. We've also got copies of a certain number of copies here. There are more on the stand downstairs. There's a link on here. You can just download that report yeah. for free. It's free. Yeah, so just, just come and access it. You don't even have to register, so it's, uh, just no. take it. <laughs> So, just come, so, I mean, I think what we're starting to see is, is growth of that within the overall kind of buying cycle as well. We're, and obviously, the other thing we see is vendor flurry. So whenever we issue these things, we're starting to see vendor press releases and whatever else coming around it. Funnily enough, it tends to be from the people that still think they're top right. The, um, so final, just, just to kind of wrap up, and then you know, if we've got any couple of minutes, we can, we can have kind of, quite, kind of questions. You know, when you look at the underlying drivers about why your organization had an LMS in the first place, none of those drivers have really gone. Okay? The compliance of driver is they're still there. It's stronger. The demand for more efficient, more scalable learning operation is, is stronger. The need for better reporting is stronger. You know, none of those things have gone away. Okay? <coughs> However much you might want to focus on the 70, the 20 and 10 has still got to be there. It's non-negotiable. And these kinds of solutions are also, therefore, always going to be part of the landscape. 
That doesn't make them the user experience, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you know, in many of you may be hiding, frantically hiding your LMS from your users because you don't want them to go there. It's too clunky. It's, it's etc. But at the end of the day, the LMS still needs to be there. It just needs to do that job better, and it needs to respond to those things. You know, both the innovation in the operating model and the strategy. Innovation in learning and what we call learning, and that's what a lot of downstairs is about, and all these new types of learning and things. But also that innovation into the talent landscape, and also around what we call what impact we get. Ultimately, that's the key thing. It's about. It's not about the hype of new learning formats. Every time I've done a lot of these conferences and spoken at virtually every one of them, and every year there's you'll go downstairs and it's oh it's all about social learning. It's all about social learning. You know, next year it's gamification. Right? or blended, or whatever it is. And if you've been to a number of them, you will absolutely know that's the case. It's not about any of that. Okay? Those are part of that, that you know, we need to be able to identify what we want. We need to be able to manage those things. But at the end of the day, and we need to be able to create a better experience, more engaging experience. It's actually about what impact we make in the business, what business value deliver. And ultimately, therefore, it's how fit for purpose those platforms are to support that overall landscape and deliver value to the business. Thank you.